All right, everybody. Let's talk watercolor tricks and 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 hacks because there is um, there are a lot of fun things that you can do with your uh, with with watercolor. And if you kind of if, if you know how to make it play and behave, um, I think you're going to have a, a bunch of fun now. One caveat about a bunch of the tricks that I'm going to show you is that um, there's, some, there's some cool tricks that will give you like crazy textures and things like that. But if you, uh, but people will sometimes go overboard on it. And they're like, oh, I've got this way now of drawing trees. And then they do this tree with the sponge. Cause like the sponge thing, oh, this really looks like leaves. And so they'll just kind of like going like, oh, I'm drawing a tree, like and, 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 and get in there with the sponge. And, um, and then it looks like you took a sponge and went nit, 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 on your page. <laughs> um, so the most important thing is not to kind of get into like, oh, I've got a technique. Um, like for some reason, the, Somebody at one point said that, you know, like, we'll be experimenting with this. Like if you sprinkle some salt on watercolor, it looks like snowflakes. It doesn't look like snowflakes. It looks like you put salt on your watercolor. And um, it's a cool effect. It's neat. But um, when you look at it, you know, it's the, the effects can be distracting but used subtlety and, and in moderation, in addition, and you sort of deliberately, they're great, but just don't let the little trick get out of hand, right? Otherwise it'll look like, like, man, you just kind of went wild with a natural sponge on your page there. But <clears throat> from this distance, bushes wouldn't look like that. But sort of knowing the, how to use these sort of techniques and, and, and effects, we can have a lot of fun today. We can have a lot of fun. So we're going to get to, it's just going to be a bunch of experimentation with a whole bunch of things. Like what happens if I do this? What happens if I do this? Ooh, look at that. And, um, and also sometimes when you're just, you know, if, if you've got, you know, I'm going to put a wash in part of the background or something. And you say like, I want to put alcohol in that just because that's the way I'm feeling today. That's great. That's great. That's fine. But, um, uh, don't let the technique stand in for observation. Okay. That being said, it's fun. And also a big part of it is just play. And if you kind of go like, wow, I really like playing with this sort of stuff this way. That's really good. And let yourself go. It'll be great. Um, are you ready? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We've got some thumbs up. We're ready to rock. So I'm going to bounce over to my share screen and let's go. Let's go there now to the world of make believe. There we are. Um, so I've got, I've got a, a, a piece of paper here and I have put some strips of drafting tape across it. Drafting tape is really cool. Um, so you'll see at the end of this demonstration, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift these pieces of tape off and I will end up with these kind of neat, crisp squares and rectangles where I've done these demos. Um, if I, if you measure them very carefully, then you can get them all be equally sized, but uh, I didn't. And I'm going to just have to be okay with that. Um, and uh, so sometimes if you're doing a little uh, a watercolor painting, what people will do is they'll have a roll of, of drafting tape. And why don't I put, let it go across the room here. I'm getting the roll of drafting tape. So you can see what a roll of drafting tape looks like if you've never seen a roll of drafting tape before. Oh, there it is. No, oh, it's already on my counter here. This is, this is a drafting tape. So what it is, it's tape that doesn't stick to your paper that much. So you can, you can peel that tape off without destroying your paper, right? Take it off slowly and carefully, and you can, and it'll work well for you. So that's that's a roll of drafting tape. So what people will do sometimes they'll, they'll sort of frame out part of a little drawing, do a watercolor painting, and then it comes up with these really crisp edges on it 
just like it is uh, like a postcard that you put down on your, your paper. I've actually seen some people put drafting tape frame, uh, frame, paint the drawing, and then take the drafting tape off and paint a little shadow underneath, sort of around the edge, as if it's a little postcard put on the page. So you can get a neat kind of trompe l'oeil effect with that. So that's trick number one, our friend the drafting tape. I should have put that on the list. Maybe I did. Um, so now let's just take a look at a few ways of putting paint on and playing with paint. And um, I think you're gonna, you're gonna enjoy this. So the first one is the most basic watercolor technique um, is called the flat wash, the flat wash. And the way that the flat wash works is I'm gonna to try to get this little box here to be an even coat of, of, of a color. Now you notice this over here has, uh, there's a little irregularity in it. Um, that's because the amount of, of, of water that was kind of in here was a little bit different. Um, and we'll be kind of playing with kind of what happens here, but let's say you want for a sky or something, you want it to be this one big kind of clear block of color. How would you go about that? Well, the trick is, it is to, to do this flat wash. So in order to do the flat wash, I'm gonna take my, my, my roll of tape here, and actually I need something a little bit higher. I'm gonna take the little margarine container here, and I'm gonna tilt my, see I've just got my margarine container underneath my, my, my palette there. I'm gonna tilt my palette up so that my palette is at an angle. So it looks flat here, but this is at an angle. The reason is, now when I put water on here, the water will have be a tendency to be pulled in this direction by gravity. So I'm gonna use, I'm gonna take advantage of that gravity. So you can hold your journal at an angle or um, I'm now just gonna take some quinacridone sienna here, make up a little pool of it. One trick for making a flat wash is number one, make sure you have enough paint to do the whole thing before you put your first mark down. If you try to remix the paint in the middle of your flat wash, it's not gonna work out well for you. And so I'm gonna just get myself a little bit more. There I go. All right, now I'm, I've got a full brush here. My brush has got kind of a, I'm putting my hand under it because I don't want a drip of it to come off. But there's a bunch of water here on my brush. So what I'm gonna do is I am going to, oh, I wasn't, I, that, so that's where I was mixing. Um, so I'm gonna charge that brush up, get a bunch of water in it, and then I paint across here. Now, as I do, notice that the bottom edge of it is darker. That's because gravity has pulled that paint down. So now what I do is I tip, dip into here, and I'm gonna come right back into that edge and I kiss the bottom of the edge and I keep touching. If I pause, then I tend to get lines. If I keep this going just smoothly back and forth, whoa. I want gravity to pull down and I want to maintain that little bead of paint on the bottom edge of it. So I may see that little, that dark line there. I want to keep that dark line. I tip my brush into that dark line and I stroke across again. If I pause, then I tend to get, um, I tend to get streaks. But now I just let it sit. And you'll notice that there's a few little irregularities in it. There's a lighter area in there. There's a darker area there. There's a lighter in there, area in there. You're going to have a tendency to want to get your brush in there and try to fix those while it's wet. Avoid that temptation. 
with a wash, when you kind of go back into it, when it's wet to try to fix things, it will just make it worse. It'll just make it worse. So with a wash, you just have to put it down and leave it there. And um, the, uh, and so that is, that's a, that's a very useful approach. In a moment, I will go back and I will fix this, but that will be after it's dry, after it's dry. So if I, there's some unevenness, for instance, this darker area here, that lighter area there, I don't like that. Again, I don't wanna go into the wash and mess with it. Just let it sit there. While it's sitting there and doing its thing and drawing though, I am going to go on to, um, to technique number two. What technique number two is called a graded wash. And there are two ways of doing this. Um, one is the traditional old fashioned way of doing it, which you, people do with a normal brush. And then there's the water brush way. So I will show you both. So what I do if I am doing the old traditional way of doing a, um, a flat wash, I mean a graded wash. Graded wash is going to go from dark to light. I'm gonna start with, again, I need to make a pool of paint that will be big enough for me to get through the whole project. And then what I do is I am going to, let's see if I can actually come down. Make that a little bit bigger. There we go. I'm gonna keep this on my tilt. And I come in and I'm gonna to try to kind of try to have that little bead of paint on the bottom. Now, as I go down, I'm just carrying that bead of paint down. But now let's say I want it to start lightening. So right, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put some more water into my palette here to squeeze from my water brush. And um, I dip into that. And now I'm going to come into this bead. And let gravity pull it down. Now I'm going to put more water onto the page here. And I'm gonna come into that bead and pull it down. And now I'm going to clean my brush off a little bit more. I'm gonna make a drop of fairly clear water and I'm gonna come into that. And I'm gonna pull that down, whoa. I'm getting a little bit of an irregularity in there. It will be worse if I kind of <clears throat> go in and mess with it. But it's so hard to, to I can think, I, I bet I can go in there, I could just, I can fix that. But then you're gonna see that that's gonna create some, as this starts to dry, some other weird things might happen right in that area where I just got in and like, oh, I can fix it. Um, but notice how we go, to go from darker to lighter. That is the traditional way of doing a graded wash. What you're doing is with each step, I'm adding more water to my brush and coming down and I get this, I get this, this effect. There is an easier way. There's an easier way that works with um, I'm gonna move 
this. Now I've got this flat here. Here's a, another sketchbook. What I'm going to do this time is I'm going to use just a regular water brush. But check this out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to dip it into my paint here. And I'm going to start painting. And as I do, what's going to happen is my brush is going to run out of pigment. I'm going back and forth. But what's happening, because I'm going kind of slowly, my water is just moving down the brush into the bristles by capillary action. So instead of drawing out, my brush stays wet, but just runs out of pigment. And I get a really simple, beautiful graded wash. So it's a very useful thing to do is to just experiment with, I'm gonna dip my, my, my brush into paint and I just want to, I want to learn how much territory I can cover with that much paint. I'm not really squeezing it as I go down or I get these sort of balloons of white of, of water into it. But it's useful for me to, to study and learn. I can get about that much territory before, my, before one brush load runs out. So very often that's, um, you know, that's the size of a, a sky in a landscape. Um, but that was just with one charged brush load going into a water brush. Isn't that cool? All right. So the, the water brush makes doing a graded wash so much easier. Now, I'm gonna put this aside for a second. I am going to dry this. Um, by the way, as I'm drying this, you'll probably see that the air might blow some pigment into an even darker pile on this. Um, you do need to be careful as you are, if you're using a hair dryer to dry a wash, because if it's really wet, pigment will, you'll, you'll blow the water or the pigment around on it and make weird patterns. Um, so here's a flat wash. Um, here's a graded wash. I uh, wanted to show you on the graded wash, if you want to make one color blend into another, the secret to do that is to do a graded wash one direction, let it dry, and then do a graded wash in the other direction. So I did the tilt the paper graded wash this way. I'm now going to do the water brush graded wash this way. So I'm gonna pick a different color. I'm gonna pick a little bit of magenta and just kind of come up, come up the other way. And I'm gonna have a not a fully charged brush because I want it to start kind of running out before it gets to the edge of the paper. So I am, oh, I'm gonna actually have to, there we go. Huh. So what I did here is I was coming along with my, um, my a, a graded wash 
in this direction. And I was thinking to myself, uh, I bet this is going to still have a bunch of pink by the time it gets down there. So I just took the tip of my brush and I tapped it lightly on my rag and then went back and a little bit later tapped it lightly on the rag. And so at those points, I was just imagine sucking pigment out of your water brush. And so I can get something that fades from purple into pink because I had a graded wash this way and then I have a new graded wash going this way. That's pretty cool. But wait, there's more because there's glazing. What glazing is, is you can put one wash on top of another wash once the base wash is dry. So here is um, uh, a, a sort of a cyan wash. I'm gonna mix up a yellow wash here. And because we've got transparent watercolors, let's come down. Because we're using transparent watercolors, um, I can put one, um, one wash on top of another. And the color that is below shows through. So here I put my wash of yellow on top of the wash of cyan. And so I'm getting this, this green stripe through. Once that bottom color is dry, I can, I can come along and make all sorts of patterns. on top of that dry coat of watercolor. And notice how the paint is staying where I put it. So if I want crisp edges, I make sure that the paint is dry before I go on to the next level. If it's still wet, I get a different effect. It's not that it's wrong, it's just that it's a different effect. And it's also really cool. And that's what's called a wet in wet wash. So let's take a look at some wet in wet. What I'm gonna do is I am going to, actually first, I am going to put some just clear water down here so that this bottom part of the page is damp. This part, you can't see it, but that's damp. There's water here on the page. If you're here live with me, it will say like, oh yeah, I can see kind of just a whole little bubble of water there. And now, so if I put paint up here, you see how it stays wherever I put it? But the minute it hits that wet edge, Look what happens. So watch it, watch it. And do you see it creep into that? It makes this soft edge. And so now if I, while this other part is wet, if I put paint into here, Watch it move. Before your eyes, it's kind of creeping around, making a soft edge, making a feathered edge. That's what paint does on a wet surface. The amount that it moves depends on how dry the paper is. So if the, if the paper is really wet, then you get these, um, then the, the, the paint moves a lot. If the, on the other hand, if the, if the paper is, um, is, is very dry, 
then it's not going to move as far. So you see up in here, you know, some of these lines here, there are, they're kind of fuzzing out, giving a softer edge, but they're not moving around as much as, watch this, I'm gonna put a little dot down in here. And it's gonna move a lot. Oh, great, now it's just staying put. <laughs> oh, but at least it's getting a soft edge. Right. So the amount of water changes what the, the paint is going to do. These effects, they will do surprising kind of uncontrolled things. And some people hate that. Um, but you can also think of it not so much as a glitch, but as a feature of this kind of, um, um, it's a feature of, 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 of this, that it does these, these lovely, unpredictable things. And that's, that's, that's one of the things that makes um, watercolor, such a, a, an enjoyable, interesting medium. Sometimes scientific illustrators don't like this wet and wet approach because it, it's unpredictable. But um, it also is absolutely beautiful. So some artists will, so other artists will really intentionally kind of leverage it for these sort of interesting, organic, blendy, weird things. If you really like control, glazing is your way to go. If you want to kind of let the paint kind of do paint things for a while, then wet and wet is a great thing to do. And also just anytime you do want a softer edge, remembering that if I first wet that paper, then I'm gonna be able to get a little wet edge in there. But wait, there's more. Um, let's take a look at some other cool things that you can do with watercolor. Um, one fun thing is what's called the back run. And so let me put down, um, I'm gonna put down some, I'm gonna put down some shadow violet here. And Remember that sort of weird pale spot through there? Um, here's some shadow violet. Now, um, my shadow violet's sitting there. It's 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 having a really good day. If I put a drop of water in here, look really carefully at what happens. Put a drop of water in here, I'm gonna put a drop of water over here. And starting to happen, starting to happen at the top more here. Notice this, I'm gonna actually, to sort of speed up this process, I'm gonna tilt the page slightly. I want this to, to move. I'm gonna put another dot drop in here. Notice what's happening. This is a back run. I have a, um, a, a drop of water here and it is, picking up little pieces of, of the pigment and it is carrying them along as this drop of water moves out and down. Um, and what happens is it pushes in front of it this zone of, um, it moves the particles of pigment around. And so I can get these areas where it's pushed paint so areas where it's kind of gotten clear and other areas where it has pushed the paint out of the way. Um, 
this can be really frustrating if I don't want that to happen. Um, but if I know that it will happen, it can be kind of cool. Um, so if you've ever gotten sort of a weird white spot with dark edges on it, what has happened is you have maybe taken a, just kind of a clear brush and, um, and pushed, I'm gonna soak up some of this water here. Um, and you know, a, a clear brush stroke across something, the, 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 the water from, the, the clear water from here can go out into that other paint, push little particles of pigment out of the way. And that makes for these zones of light with dark around the edges of them. Um, knowing that that can happen is a reason that a lot of people will not get in and kind of try to modify a wash once it's put on. Because once I kind of get in there and try to start fixing things, I can get also some of these weird background effects and it, uh, it's confusing. It's unpredictable. Um, and sometimes really beautiful. I'm going to uh, mop this up. I'm going to put on a different color. Um, let me try this. I'm gonna just sort of see with, a different color of paint. If I put darker paint onto something, I tend not to get background effects. Um, I mean, a more intense pigment. But if I am coming in with a brush and it is, there's more water in it, then that will start to kind of move things around and I will get these background effects. Not. I think I liked the effects that I had there better before. Maybe I'll just leave this alone. Let's talk a little bit about the idea of, you know, so, so the, the, the first, paint that I had that um, shadow violet, uh, those particles really moved around a lot. It didn't really stain the paper. And that allows me to be able to, um, if I don't like where a color is, I can come in and lift it out. So while this is damp, I can come in and lift out part of that paint before it dries. Some types of paint sit right on the surface and they're easy to clean off. For instance, this paint up here is manganese blue hue. And it is really easy. This is totally dry. This is totally dry. I put this on last night. But check this out. I'm gonna come in here and get this part pale light. And look at that. I just made a very clear white spot in the middle of that. Hold on a second, let me grab a paper top. So the reason that I was able to get out that little white spot so clearly is because I know that this paint, manganese blue hue, sits right on the surface and doesn't stain the paper. The opposite of that, even though this color down here looks very similar, this is phthalo blue. I'm gonna do the same kind of scrubbing out with this and look at how the phthalo blue gets a little bit more pale but it is not wanting to come off. I'm gonna dab it with a paper towel. Maybe I'll be able to get a little bit more up. 
Yeah, see, I made it a little bit more pale, but compare those two. The phthalo blue is much more of a staining color. And that, um, so knowing your, knowing your paint makes a big difference. Some colors, while they're wet, you can still get a little bit of it out. Other colors, and the best way to do this is just to test the paints that you have, make a little swatch and then try to lift out part of it. Phthalo blue, for instance, it does not like, it, it stains the paper. And once it's there, it's there. It's gonna be there for a long time. Um, knowing this, that some paints stain and some don't, let's say I want to put a big white fluffy cloud in the sky. I'm gonna mix up a little bit of manganese blue. Give myself a little graded wash of that. Or actually let's put a little bit of ultramarine in the sky above it. Oh, it's still wet. Wet and wet, those kind of blend together. But um, now I want, hold on, we need to keep this. There we go. So we're working on this one here. I know that a bunch of this is done with manganese blue hue, which is not staining. And there's a few little white clouds in the sky. So I'm just gonna take a crumpled up piece of tissue paper. And what I do is I take a, a part of it and I get it all kind of wrinkly. And then I can come in and I can tap. Look, I just tapped it and look what happened. That was just one little tap. And if I go in again, I can lift out a cloud shape. Isn't that cool? So some people think with watercolor, once it's down, then you, I mean, that's a, that's a reasonable little patch of puffiness right there. But had I done this with phthalo blue, I would not have clouds that are so bright. Hmm, that's fun. That's really fun to do. Let me show you a few kind of similar uh, effects since we're kind of in this kind of getting white spots into darker colors. I'm not gonna go with my full order here. Um, Let's take a look at other ways of having white interacting with um, uh, sort of getting whites in, into a drawing. One of them is masking fluid. This is a Molotow masking fluid pump marker. And it's got a liquid inside of it. I take the tip off and there's a sort of blue point here. Um, with that, I can um, let's say I've got you know a stem of some plant coming down here um, and a leaf. off there, there'll be another leaf in here. I'm, I, it looks like I'm kind of drawing with this kind of messy blue marker, right? There'll be another stem of something, this one will be thicker, that is back here.
So I draw this in. And then I let it dry. That dries pretty fast. Um, and you can say to yourself, well, why do I want to have sort of this weird blue marker on my, my page? That blue is actually just there to allow you to see where you've put the masking fluid on. It's not staining the paper. It is a little rubberized liquid that once it dries is easy to rub off or relatively easy to rub off. So what I'm going to do now that it's dry, I'm dry, mostly. I'm gonna let it dry a little bit more. Maybe I'll jump over and do something else while this is drying a little bit more. That would be smart, All right? So while that's dry, let's go check out what you can do with crayons. This is a crayon. It is a white crayon. The only crayon you will ever need is a white crayon. White crayons are great because Let's say there are some white clouds up in the sky. If I hold my head at an angle, I can see the shape of the cloud that I've drawn with white crayon. Now I'm gonna put a few closer to the horizon smaller, more horizontal clouds. I just drew in some clouds with my little white crayon. That was fun. But now let's go for blue sky. Once the crayon is down, I don't have to wait for anything to dry. I can just come along here and go do 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 And you're thinking, but oh no, there are all these like weird little blue drops in the middle of my cloud. I wish that those weren't there. Well, those are just beaded up on top of the paper. I mean, on top of the the wax. Um, so I can try to lift those off with my brush like that, or I can also take a clean piece of tissue paper and just tap them lightly and away they go. And I get these neat little easy peasy clouds. Isn't that cool? Those are fun to do. Um, a advanced version of those clouds is that if I first, I get a little bit of. Uh, um, I get a little bit of. Are we on the screen? Yep. Here we go. Um, if I paint in some of the bottom edges of my clouds here, so I've got some shadow violet there, and I am. There are some the bottom edges of my clouds. And then you can sometimes, you know, have fun with your clouds. You can even let, you know, little hints of other color. There's a little bit of blue in my cloud here. I'm gonna um, just bring a little bit of purple into that one because it's fun. Um, and then I let them dry. Um, so again, I'm going to use my airbrush. Uh, 
Now, I am going to put white above them and may even kind of slightly overlap it. Turn my head sideways. All right, I've got a little bit of fun cloudness there. Now, when I clear these off, there are some shadows also inside those clouds. I'm going to get this part here a little bit more wet so that I can pick up those little bits. more interesting to have some shadows in those clouds than just to have the clouds be straight um, white. But it's hard to put color into the clouds after after you put the crayon on. So those are also kind of fun cloud effects. The crayon works because uh, the watercolor doesn't like to go on wax. Another great source of wax is a birthday candle. So you could carry a... Um, a crayon with you, or you could carry a birthday candle and then you're ready for any birthday party. Never know when that will come in handy. Um, another thing that you can do is to use uh, Prismacolor pencils. So this is a white Prismacolor pencil. And if I put down some lines of wax with that, Those are gonna work as a resist. It won't be as sharp and as extreme as what you get with the crayon. Um, here's another option. This is the uh, Prismacolor Colorless Blender. And so this is used for um, often blending. Uh, it's just wax. It's the same kind of wax that a, um, that you find in a Prismacolor pencil, but it doesn't have any pigment at all. In it. Um, so I can put these onto a drawing. And then if I come in with my paint, my paint doesn't like to go on top of the wax. When you first put it down, you'll feel like, oh no, I can't see anything that I have. And then it's one of these things where you're going to wait for it, wait for it, and your lines will begin to emerge as the wax, uh, as the water starts to retreat from the wax. So as you're watching this, you're seeing those pencil lines now emerging out of the green.
And because it is, because it is, uh, is, is waxy, I can also take a clean brush and go over those lines and help pull some of the paint off those lines and they become even brighter. I'm just gonna let this dry a little bit more and we'll see what patterns we get. The wax pencils also work great on watercolor that is already dry. So I always carry a white Prismacolor pencil with me because um, I can come along and draw on top of, um, I can draw on top of watercolor that I've already put down and get little highlights back into my drawing. Notice that it's not pure white. You get a little bit of that color. So don't expect it to go to pure white. Another useful thing. This one, I'm gonna let it continue to dry. Now, uh, while that's happening, let's take a look at some um, other really fun effects that you can get. Um, lift this up. So, Um, let's see, what do we want to do first? Um, let's play with a little bit of splatter. Um, I've just got a little brush here and I am going to flick it. And I can get cool splatter effects. If you splatter with different colors, then you've got different colors of splatter. I know, you knew that, but um, it's often more visually interesting than just one color of splatter, because now you've got two colors of splatter. If there's something that you don't want to get splattered, you can take um, rags or tissues and use those to kind of make a mask, um, or if you've got you know, here's somebody's business card. I'm gonna put that over here. Here's some post-its. I'm gonna put those over here. And then if I splatter, I don't have to worry about, I'm kind of making my own mask. So splatter effects are really fun. Um, People, what people will tend to do is just say like, oh, I'm gonna use this on a beach where there's sand. And then it looks like, you know, you put splatter on your sand. Um, you're thinking this is totally gonna to look like sand grains. <laughs> and then it doesn't. However, a little bit of a flick of this stuff across, across a beach will kind of give you a little bit of irregularity too much. And it is not going to uh, you'll, you'll, you'll wish you did not, right? So use splatter effects in moderation. It's cool, but again, um, moderation is going to be your friend. Another great effect that you want to use with moderation is the natural sponge. So here is a piece of a natural sponge. And I like to kind of just get a little nug of it. You just need a nugget of it this big to throw in your nature journal kit. And I like one with different kinds of edges. So not ones that have all been kind of trimmed by, by, by a knife. This has some of these kind of frilly edges. It's got 
more cut edges. It's got lumpy sides. It's got a lot of different kinds of surfaces. So when you're looking around for a sponge, so pick up one that has, and you can buy, usually you buy a big sponge like this, and then you can cut it up into a, a bunch of pieces and give them to all your nature journaling friends. So only one of you, you needs to kind of run out and get some, uh, a, a natural sponge, and then you can supply all of your friends. And what's cool about this is that it gives you this very uh, random looking, almost leafy effect. I'm gonna give myself a little bit of wet paint here. Right. And let's see what the sponge does. This is, it's a really fun tool. So what I do is I kind of just wad it up. I get an interesting looking surface and I'm just going to dip that into my water, pick up some, some paint with it and then tap it lightly here. I then can change the color. So I'm gonna wet one of my little pads of paint. I am going to come in here at the natural sponge. So it's really fun. Now let's get a darker value. And you're thinking like, oh, I'm gonna use this for all my trees. It does have sort of a tree-y leafy look to it. Um, but in isolation, it tends to look like you've just been dapping around with a natural sponge. Um, so one way of handling this and using it, let's bump over to the other page for just a second. Let's say I had a mass of foliage in you see here, yep. So I've got a little mass of foliage in here. Um, I might start you know, here's here's just sort of a background. Um, there's also sky behind it. And letting the edges of those kind of wet into wet into each other. Um, so I've got a, a kind of a green lump that is. And I just want to, I want to add a little bit of a sense of texture to my green lump. So I'm going to grab a little bit of Just a little bit of a variation on that and it's going to, it will sort of throw some, some nice randomness into the bush that I'm doing. And that's going to look 
a little bit more tree-esque than um, if I'm only making the tree with doing this. Also be aware that you're not gonna get, be able to get in there and fill in those little interstitial spaces with blue if there's blue air behind them. That's not gonna work well for you. Um, so you wanna put that background in first and then, so this is really kind of coming out to sort of a nice, lovely, lively, organic form here. It's got variation into it. And it doesn't feel as much as if you just kind of like, oh, you've got your sponge. You're having fun with your sponge. So it's, 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 it's like the sponge, but more subtle. There's a bunch of other cool things that you can do. Uh, we're just gonna show two more though. And one, is the scrape. This is cool. Um, if you ever wanted light uh, trunks against a dark surface, um, let's say we have some trees. Uh, Oh, you, um, oh, oh, oops, sorry. Yep. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So I've given myself kind of a wet and wet blob of, 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 of where my, my little tree is going to be. Um, right now, it is really, really, really wet in this. And in order to, for scraping to work, I can't have it be really goopy wet. I want it just on the edge of drying is the sweet spot. So just on the edge of, of, of drying. And this isn't there yet. So I put wet and wet stuff in there. It's playing together. But now I want to get some light branches in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this just start to dry. And every once in a while, I'm going to kind of just tilt my head around and see how dry it is. And... Um, by seeing, do I still see, so just as the shine of the water is beginning to come off of it, that's the sweet spot for doing uh, the scrape technique. If I do it too early, so what, with the scrape, what I'm gonna be doing is trying to let this start to dry and I will be pushing out of my way some of this dried thick sort of paste. One way to do that is if you've got a small blade, or if you've got an old credit card, all right, look, it's me. Um, if, if you've got an old credit card and uh, you can cut it into this uh, sort of a little carver, so it's got a little rounded edge. With one credit card, you can also supply a bunch of your friends. So I've got a few points of different, uh, different widths. And if I do it too early and the, and the paper is wet, what happens is as I push this across it, it's going to kind of tear up the texture of the paper in that area, make a dent on the page that is also kind of roughened. And all the paint and pigment will slosh into that because it's all wet, making a darker line. So if I scrape, let's say there's a little branch that I want to be in here and I kind of come in there and I scrape, you see how that made a darker line, right? Yeah, right, so if I try to scrape it and I get these dark lines, that means I am too soon to be scraping. And so then I just kind of go like, so I'll do a little test, too soon, okay. I'm just gonna go around, gonna do something else, I'm gonna, I'm going to play with some alcohol, not like that. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to um, appropriately use alcohol here. Um, what I've got, uh, letting that dry, I'm going to show you this alcohol trick. Um, I've got some rubbing alcohol, 
that you don't ever want to drink. And this is fun. Um, I'm going to get uh, what color? I'm going to get some little magenta paint in here. There's a little block of magenta paint. Now, this is always just such a delight and a surprise. Um, what I'm going to do is I am going to flick into this um, a little bit of alcohol. You ready? So I've got some alcohol on this brush and I'm just gonna bring my finger back and I'm gonna go flick. Ooh. Isn't that neat? And what it does is it pushes the paint out away from those areas. I'm gonna, let's just do it. I'll put some of that in the, to, to the tree. Oh, look at that. I put some in the tree. Wow, that's, it's just so weird what it does. Um, I'm gonna let this dry a little bit more. And then, and actually, while that is, I'm gonna give it another flick. While that's happening, let's take the same color and come up back into this box here. Whoops, into this box here. This color, by the way, is naphthalide maroon, a Daniel Smith color. And this time I raided the pantry and I got some salt. And I'm gonna sprinkle a little bit of salt into my palm. And I'm gonna then take that and sprinkle it onto the surface of the paper here. And I will come back a little bit later to see what that has done. So I've just put it down and I'm gonna come back later. I'm now going to go back down and see how my how my little tree scrape zone is feeling. All right, back here to the tree scrape. Oh, I may be a little bit too late now. There we go. So I'm scraping some branches into this. And in some places it's taking and others not quite as well. But it gives me a hint of some paler branches back there. And then what I like to do is to then re-partially cover some of those with With darker paint. And then you can have some places where there are branches that stick through and other places that they're not sticking through. Let's try a little bit more alcohol splatter in here. Now that's a little bit drier. Not as dramatic. Um, 
Let's see. My timing um, <clears throat> on my scrapes did not come out the way I was expecting. Um, let me let me just do yeah do one more kind of uh, so I can get my get this scrape demonstration to work a little bit better um, because this is. Uh, the, the demo that I did, I don't think did it justice. I'm gonna put down a dark color. And this is mostly dry already. And let's Try the knife. So I want a bigger trunk. So I'm pushing, I'm scraping that paint off. They have to be, sort of the timing has to be just right so that um, the paint is um, thick enough to be pushed and not so runny that it, it sloshes back into that. Um, some people are saying, well, might say, well, yeah, why don't you just use, use your white pencil which seems to give me the same effect. This is true. Um, so here, drawing over this with a white pencil, let's say I wanted to put some branches into this foliage here. There might be, you know, I might see part of a trunk coming up here, and then it's, you know, maybe part of it here, and might see part of a little trunk over here. Um, yes, you can do that. Um, people, there are some people who are really purists about watercolor and they don't want, um, uh, so they, they, they really don't like it if there's anything like graphite pencil or colored pencil, they say it's no longer a watercolor uh, drawing, it's, it's now mixed media. And they, um, like you can't, if you put a uh, colored pencil on your drawing, in, in many watercolor shows, they would now no longer let you show that piece in the watercolor show. Um, but we're not doing this for a watercolor show. We're doing this for us and, and ourselves. Um, and so I'm not really bent out of shape by having something that is not pure watercolor, uh, mixed media. If you want to have white lines and you're trying to do a pure watercolor, then you need to scrape everything out. I find that it's also just great to, to have your colored pencil and be able to, to kind of get those lights um, back on, on the surface. Um, and so, add those in, add some little white trunks in with my pencil. Um, those are just kind of, those are a, a handful of techniques which, which you can play with. And then if you did this on a piece of paper, 
that uh, you had put your uh, used drafting tape on. Let's see, you can start to peel some of this off. Look at these kind of fun, crisp edges that you get. Oh, Jack, we have a question in the chat. Yes. Somebody is asking, what was a Henway that was on the supplies list? Oh, uh, what's a Henway? Uh, about four or five pounds. You, wait, you're thinking that couldn't have been just a setup for making that lousy joke, but oh, yes, it was. Oh, yes, it was. Um, the, uh, isn't that fun to, it's very satisfying to, to peel off drafting tape. It's almost as fun as like, you know, picking out a scab or something like that. Where you can play. Oh, look, right? But uh, this, you're, you're not, you know, poking a hole in yourself. We had one more question. Yes. Um, and that was whether you'd finished the masking fluid part or not. Oh, oh, the, totally forgot about the masking fluid one. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, yes, that's right. Yeah, there's, there's masking fluid, just with the masking fluid on it. And like, wouldn't that be great if that was all it was? Um, now, here's what's up with the masking fluid. Um, let's say these are light little branches against a dark surface. Well, um, Let's put that dark in. And let's make it even darker. Maybe thinking, well, that doesn't look very good. But the, um, the masking fluid, um, dries uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a way that is going to protect the paper from, it protects the paper from uh, from the paint. So now what I can do is I wait for this to dry. Thank you for reminding me. I will pick at some of this stuff while we're waiting for that. Um, oh, it's so much fun to take off this tape. Um, so yeah, it, it dries in this uh, waterproof layer and I'm tilting my page and it my my it's still I can still see water on it so it's a little bit damp let's actually come back to this in a moment um, and see if there's any other questions by that time the paint that will be on here was on here will have dried All right um, so what is some uh, are there any other questions about some of the techniques which we looked at I'm checking for that, but um, one person did ask if you could sort of zoom back a bit so that they could sort of see all of the techniques side by side all at once. Sure. Well, actually, the, the salt is beginning to do its thing also. So I'm going to zoom down on the salt. In the salt area, so this is it's going to kind of happen more as it dries, but in the salt area, do you see these little kind of white star shapes that are popping up in there. Um, those are places where the salt is making the, uh, the, the, the paint kind of retreat in interesting ways. You often kind of get weird kind of stellar patterns uh, from, from these. 
So if you have a big wash of paint and you dropped salt in it, just let that sit there, leave it. And um, it, um, that's, that's, what's, that's what's kind of fun about, um, about the salt. It's more kind of hard edge sort of crystally things. Um, I did find another question. Um, yes. In the cases with the crayon, um, Eleni asks, would, would um, white pastel work as well? Uh, no. Um, the, the reason that the crayon works is because it is waxy. And so um, I, I've never actually tried it with oil pastels. Um, but the, um, with the, definitely with chalk pastels, um, it wouldn't work because your, your paint's gonna go right through that. Um, so these are, but think of these as, as effects and, but it's not a substitute for, for observation. see. Were there any other questions? I'm not seeing any, um, but if anybody has any, please put them into the chat. Okay. Um, our masking fluid demo is not quite dry. Uh, maybe what we'll do is while we're letting that dry, we'll just sort of check in with people and just sort of see what is happening in people's sketchbooks. Um, and that, um, that, that would be, that would be useful. Um, let's start with um, our friend Kate. Hey, Kate, good to see you. Uh, what's been going on in your sketchbook? Well, you'll be excited to know that I have decided to go from doing one sketchbook per month, which has been my thing where I get a sketchbook and I fill it up, to two. Oh. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want to do more of the observational nature journaling now that it's warm enough to hold a pen outside for longer than 10 minutes before it starts to get really uncomfortable. <laughs> so I've got a sketchbook that's for practice stuff. So I keep doing my like hundreds and hundreds of word drawings. And I have another one that's for uh, observations or like a daily journal page, which is really exciting for the trip uh, because we need to have a lot of biodiversity in there. Oh, so this is kind of the Ray Bonto technique. Um, how he's yeah. got that uh, he's got his his field journal and then he's got his his study book. Yeah, so I've been kind of practicing some things. Like I know in the South they have beautiful oak trees, so I've been working on drawing trees with negative space, oh. figuring out how to capture those. And just some yeah. images. Then just the usual. Oh, and a coiling snake is such a challenging subject, isn't it? Actually, or was, a, was that a lakeless lizard? Yeah. Um, I follow yep. a bunch of herpetologists on Instagram now, and I love drawing from their stuff. It's been a real challenge, but it's so rewarding. That's um, cool. Yeah. Did some horse sketches. This one's actually interesting because it's the glazing technique. What I did was I painted the whole thing with uh, uh, quinacrone gold, uh, mm -hmm. and then I layered on other stuff like uh, with, not Windsor, um, I think it was Imperial Violet, the purple they have on the palette and some other things to kind of block it out. And then the quinacone gold sort of glowed out from underneath mm. that. Mm. Um, I, I love also good job on punching those shadows. Oh, thank you. Uh, what else? Just some birds, the friend's dog. And here we'll get to the good part. Now I only have two days of the May Nature Journal in, but you can see them both here. Oh, you had a little rain, rainstorm and a black and a, a black-throated gray warbler. I love when people can ID birds right off my drawings. Oh, whoa. I love, I've, I've got warbler envy. Yeah, well, after comes your warbler class, I missed the last one. Oh, neat, neat. And uh, on the little raindrops there. Um, yeah, I was putting those in during class. 
So talk to folks about kind of your approach for kind of making a raindrop look raindroppy. Okay, so there's a whole process to it. So basically what I'll start with is once I finish this drawing, um, I went and took basically slightly darker than the hue of what's on here. And I did a little circle and I let those dry. And then on the top end, because if I'm assuming that the light is coming from over here, yeah, over here, I put a little dark patch on that end and use a little bit of water just to fade it out. I'd let that dry again. And then I draw the shadow um, on the flowers. I use shadow violet on the leaves. I used a uh, perline green, mm -hmm. um, trade that shadow. I came back another for another pass after I'd done the initial little wash and faded it out um, and did a really concentrated pigment right up close to the edge where it would be darkest. And then yeah. to finish it off, I took some white gouache and um, I did some on the top and I just did a little tiny streak on that bottom edge that gets reflected, so. That's cool. So folks notice that the highlight is in the part of the water drop that is the darkest mm -hmm. and the shadow is against the part of the water drop that is the lightest. And that's actually how they look. Uh, it's as if they want to kind of help us put contrast into our drawings. Um, so again, the, the dark shadow is next to the lightest part of the raindrop. Yeah. And the highlight is in the darkest part of it. If that were reversed, then the highlight wouldn't show up and the, the, the shadow would just blend in with the... Um, with that uh, darker part of the drop. Um, that's really cool. Well done. Yeah, and you can find instruction how to do the water drops in um, the drawing weather video in the lesson archive on Jack's website. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. So I, I like this approach now, kind of you're gonna have, uh, a, it'll be great that you're kind of getting out and sketching from life in the field. Um, that's exciting to see. I'm really excited. I initially wasn't going to do the trip, but then I thought, all right, it's a road trip. It's the longest helping people move thing I've ever gotten roped into going from San Diego to South Carolina. Oh, but wow. I'm really excited because with all the time in the car, I'll be able to refine my field sketches. <laughs> yeah. That's my great. Doesn't know my enthusiasm for birding yet. So she's in for a real treat. <laughs> That's really fun. Have, have a fantastic time. When do you leave? Um, the 14th. All right. Have a great time. Yeah. Thank you. We look forward to seeing this. The, uh, I'll the, have a really good, your, 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 your pencil miles trip. on the road trip miles. Oh yeah. That's cool. Um, <laughs> let's join, um, Eleni the doodler, um, and see what's happening in your journal. By that time, I think we'll be ready to, to, uh, by the time you're done, we'll be ready to play with the, uh, masking fluid. Um, hey there, and you can now unmute. Greetings. Hi, Jack and everyone. Thanks for fabulous uh, workshop. I have a question that sounds like a joke, but it's not a joke, which is, um, why do you remove the tape? Because then you don't know what the techniques are. I mean, unless you're ah. you and you do know what the techniques are, but I kind of want to, you know, I work sideways and backwards and stuff. I want to leave the tape in there because oh, you absolutely can. You absolutely yeah, because otherwise I won't. I won't know what I what I've been up to. Yes, that that's that's totally reasonable. But the one reason to to remove the tape is that it's kind of fun to remove the tape. I know, and it makes really great lines. <laughs> yeah. Um. Basically, I remove the tape just because it's just so much fun to kind of like. Oh, I get to move the tape now. Like. You can, you have your tongue kind of stick out as you do. Indeed. So I did a journal page this morning. Um, uh, just hanging around with the and some other pencil milers. I don't know if it's really anything to show, but what it's just random things from outdoors. Oh, the best bleeding heart. Part, the best part was that I was able to turn the, count, uh, the camera around and ask people what I was looking at. And it's just mm -hmm. the, the, the wonder of community. Um, huh. I just 
didn't know, I couldn't remember what a bleeding heart was, the Helleborus. So I am just getting back into gear. Oh, and I that's thought if I'd, fun. That's I thought fun. if I'd showed this page, it would give other people encouragement because it's way in the beginning of things. So oh, and some it's also cool to see uh, you testing burns. the colors and playing with the colors before you drop it onto the little bleeding heart flower. Yeah, I wanted That's to see smart. I, if I could get that. And the other thing was I followed one or more of the tips that, that uh, you talked about the other day. Um, you know, there's a, different approaches to drawing. So I, I did a contour and then I did like just the feel of it. And then um, when I get back out there again, I'm just going to do blocks of color. So just sort of isolating different pieces of what I'm seeing so that I reduce the overwhelm of trying to capture all of it. Yeah. Um, when, yeah, when you, when, when you're out in the middle of everything, it is, it can be overwhelming, especially when somebody's just starting nature journaling, there's so much going on. Yes. You know, and, and we have this fear of missing out. I've got to get them all. No, you don't. Um, Let's just spend a little bit more quality time with this little moment over here or this little moment over here. And you won't see everything, but that which you do see, you will truly see. Yeah. And, um, and then it sticks with you in a way that's totally different than if we just, you know, look and go, like, oh, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks and, a lot. And thank you for um, for sharing that uh, that page. My pleasure. Um, let's see. Uh, my my paint is still a little bit damp. Um, so, is there anybody else that had something that they felt like sharing? Let's join uh, Susan. Hey, good to see you. Oh, wait, hold on. Good. Oh, now good. we're good. There all we right. go. Hey, yeah. Didn't quite have all of the uh, the tools and things, but I was doing that. And I, and I did peel the tape off and then lit. Oh. Sorry, it's terribly loud up there. It's almost one of them. Moving furniture upstairs. Um, but yeah, that's my, I, it, um, I, I jumped the gun a little bit and I put some color in behind my masking fluid. And then I tried to remove the masking fluid. I think this, this, because I have this, I got this years ago and I think it's super old because I've, I've tried to use it before, like tested it out and I had a great deal of difficulty removing it. So I'll see if you have any tips when you get to that. But Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll show you my removal tip. Actually, yeah, I can show you my removal tip. If it's dry, then you can use it now. Right now. Want to see the removal tip? It is, there's, you are not, so if you've had, ever had trouble removing it, um, this is actually a chunk of a masking fluid remover that oh. other people have had so much trouble removing masking fluid. They actually made a masking fluid remover. It comes in a big square block and I just cut it into a bunch of nuggets and gave the other nuggets to friends. And I've got one little nugget in my sketch kit. I've got another little nugget um, around here and it feels a little bit like an eraser but it's a little bit more firm and it does a really good job. Uh, uh, Mary Larson is saying that um, the mono, the, the, the mono erasers uh, work very well for her at removing masking fluid. Well, I will say I, I've, other times I've used this, this stuff that you have to paint on and I found it very easy to remove and it's worked really well. The only difficulty is it does gum up the brush. So you have to use a really cheap brush yeah. and preferably wash it immediately and it's been tricky. So that's not something I would try and bring on the field because I'm just you make a mess and you just put all the text everywhere and of course. But um, yeah, <laughs> so, so that one I've not had any trouble removing, but this this blue stuff I've had before. Yeah, but um, uh, just show you. I've been I've been geeking out on some some cool geology, and oh. geology that I intend to geek out some more on. Let's um, do. Is is there any um, any of the geeking out? Is it uh, a visual that we could see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's see what's going on. So there's this cool preserve um, that I went to, and first went to last year, 
that's uh it's all it's on it's on the Helderberg escarpment so it's this big like big old cliff that comes up out of the surrounding valley I think it's basically like the northern part of the Catskills basically and um so and and this this preserve is on pond this, this escarpment uh and the rock is all it's all um has these fissures and then holes and things all through the all through the surrounding area and the the sign at the front says it's on limestone, so it's limestone, and that all these fissures are formed by um, like acidified rain coming through and eating away at the limestone and making oh, this whole cool. thing. So, so I was just I was kind of going, I was just kind of geeking out over where I was seeing. I actually this 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 time was a few weeks ago and it was very cold, so I had to sort of go out, draw something, go back to the car, warm up, and add some color, and then go out and draw something else and warm up and add some color. But so this was really fun to see. Like I was just really interested in how the plants and things are growing uh. on what seems to be very little soil because in a lot of places, the rock is very close to the surface and there's just a bunch of leaf litter. And here I found this rock sitting on the ground, moss growing on that, little, little, um, yes. I don't know what, the, what are they called, the little, uh, thingies that, that the reproductive structures, but those are there. Um, and then a pile of leaves. And then there are these flowers that you can't really see very well, um, just happily growing in basically nothing. Um, huh. <laughs> so, um, uh, the same flowers as these. Um, so that was, that was really interesting. And so this, I was sort of trying, trying to sort of get a sense of like, this, this is like what's going on with the, with the, the, the rocks. Oh, There's, the like, cross the section is here. so helpful here. Yeah, so you can just like look down these like fissures and in, into like the 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 you know I don't know the pit of despair. And there are also places where the, the where the you'll see the ground topography just kind of goes like, zoop. and yeah. I'm like, okay, yeah. better not step there. Don't step there. I have a <laughs> what could possibly go that, wrong. <laughs> that this is what's in there. And there was still some actually some ice. I, I could sort of peer down at some of these things, and there's some ice down in there. So I'm not sure how deep they go. There was some stuff on the sign at the front about. Um, there's a nearby town that's kind of downhill from there and that that they they basically can't like build anything or do any farming or anything on this area because the the water like the, the you know the water table the water supply for the town comes from this area and will get like mm -hmm. because of the way that I, I don't quite understand all of the details of how this all works but have to be really careful so it's very interesting um oh people are asking about um the pH. So I think, if I understand correctly, because this is limestone, that in itself would be alkaline, right? So it would have a mm -hmm. high, P, high pH, right? And so acid, when combined with something alkaline, is, is going to like, you know, react very strongly and will tend to eat away at the, the limestone. Um, so uh, basically, this is the opposite of acidic, this, this whole, the rock here. So yeah, so I was, I was like drawing a picture of the one of those, like just sort of like pits, oh, there cool. in the ground is very cool. And there's all moss mossy in there. everywhere. Yeah. There is so much moss in this place, and actually, so and again, I need to go back and like study some moss some more because the on the sign at the front, the, the people who owned that property, who owned this land, and then donated it as a preserve, they were actually ecologists at the local university. Um, so they had this land, didn't do anything with it other than do cool science with it. But apparently they were like studying the mosses in the area and there's lots of like rare mosses, but I don't know which rare mosses yeah. how to recognize them. So I need to study up on mosses so I can learn that. But yeah, so that was, that was fun. Um, and then went back to the same place uh, just recently that was like a week that was like two weeks ago and back last week um and all the wildflowers are like even more sprouting and i know from having from coming on there last year mm -hmm. in another few weeks it'll be totally different wildflowers and all those like spring ephemerals are are coming up so i was having lots of fun with oh that. that's cool so i am also loving the shadows and the dark background behind those light I was so pleased with that. I got, it, it helped that I was, you know, that that was exactly what I was seeing. But yeah, the 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 little stamens are casting a shadow on the petals, and so I was able to make the stamens show up. Oh uh, yeah. By having the shadow and then doing the stamens on top of that, so you could actually see them. So that was fun. Uh, it was really tricky to get something that looks like a very pale colored flower, but just dark enough that I could put white on top of it, and you'd still see it. 
So that was, yep. was tricky. But oh, yeah. and that view of the flower, so interesting. That side view one, that's a cool angle. Yeah, so they were got, really, really neat. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> I was, neat. That, was, that was definitely. I was drawing little circles and trying to draw sort of like the bowl shape that the that the yep. petals are making, and then try and get the shape. And so, um, yeah, and, and then it's really cool. So last year I was there in May, and the, all these leaves were out, and they're really interesting looking leaves. But the flowers were all gone, and I found like, who is this? Yeah, were, right. So I was like, okay, I have to go back in April and find them. So the the same flowers that I drew the previous time, or that, and yeah, and all kinds of other like there's like leaves coming up of all kinds of other flowers that I'm looking forward to seeing. So I want to go back there, um, you know, over the next few weeks and see all these like spring ephemerals. Because last year in May, it was all covered in like three different species of violets, and um, and the, the trillium and all kinds of cool flowers. It's just really, really awesome. So yeah, and then all kinds of cool things. And then uh, more on geology, because I was wondering about the, like how are plants growing on this, on this, on this, this rock that seems to be like very shallow soil and just bedrock. So I found a tree that had fallen over. Oh. And so that I could really kind of see, because I don't, and I don't know how clear it is from this picture. So that's why I ended up then trying to sort of redraw it in more of a, diagram form but all the roots like make this sort of like flat plane where they just kind of like all bend and sort of cut off on this this plane that's the bottom of the the root ball basically and it's all full of more of these chunks of rocks so i'm thinking that basically the roots of the tree have sort of like gone through the first few layers of the rocks and intertwined but when they hit more layers of rock they couldn't get through that they will have sort of bent and gone horizontal and you end up with this very shallow root ball that's kind of intertwined with the rock. And then eventually when it fell, then it pulled up these rocks. And, you know, and so, but it doesn't go very deep. So what I don't know is, you know, there, there's another crack in the rocks right here and more elsewhere. Mm -hmm. well, so what I don't know is like, are there more roots that are somewhere in there that I couldn't see? Because again, it, it's like kind of dangerous to try and get too close because the footing was so bad. So I kind of wanted to check it out. But yeah, so I don't know if there's like, Maybe there's like still a taproot, and I don't know if hemlocks do. I'm pretty sure it's a hemlock. <laughs> Not poison hemlock there. Don't worry. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Different kind. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I don't know if hemlocks do like a big taproot or something. So I need to look that up right now uh, cool. and, and see. But yeah, so like I'm very curious. Like, you know, are these trees that are like these big, nice, well, decent sized trees, you know, on, in this forest? Um, that's on this very thin soil like how secure are they more secure than other plants because they can like reach down within the the you know and get the roots inside the cracks in the rocks or are they less secure because most of the root surface mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the surface or what Unperched. and how are they getting how are, what that's kind of nutrients cool. are they getting so yeah so I have lots of fun with that uh, and then there was a sort of little side mystery about um, there's this white substance on the rocks only on these rocks Hmm. pretty much well pretty much every other rock that I kind of a little see, crusty yeah like almost every other bit of exposed rock was like mostly moss and a teeny tiny bit of rock so you couldn't really see but these ones had this little white stuff so i'm speculating i think i will have a, i have a possible answer that i need to kind of put some stuff in here about um uh, dissolved salts that get deposited on limestone apparently this happens a lot so oh. apparently people who use limestone in their like architecture and stuff, apparently get very upset about this efflorescence stuff. And so there's lots of articles about that in the context of architecture. But oh, I'm, that's like, so yeah. cool. The salt, so I don't know for sure if that's what it yeah. is, but it certainly looks like the pictures that I was looking at of that, um, of like salts that get that are dissolved in the water that get deposited on the limestone. Um, that might be what, what is producing that, that white. Yeah. Oh, that's really neat. That's really fun. Yeah, and that's fun. Oh, Susan, that was that was really cool. And I love seeing um, I love how you're visualizing these things kind of seeing down into these cracks. A bunch of people were commenting about that cross section. And I really like that as a visualization. Also, the tree that's fallen over and then the diagram, the sort of simplified kind of block diagram of that tree that's that's tilted over yeah, you can sort of see funny. i can see the topologist in you <laughs> yeah a bit um yeah i was well i was having fun because i was like i was trying to do it and i was trying not to make it too complicated 
Um, but trying to kind of get the idea. But then I, what I realized is that the, like, you know, I was, I was really trying to like get like a, sh- a shadow on this side and the light on the tarp on the top. So you would be able to see mm-hmm. that sort of broader three dimensional shape. And it wasn't really coming through. So that's why I said, well, let me just draw the same thing over here. So we get like, what does it look like? But also, you know, what's the overall structure that I didn't quite get in the table. So that was. That's a, that's a really great solution to that. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. All right. Now my uh, watercolor is dry. So let me just bounce over to the camera again. And there it is. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm lightly brushing it now with this little pickup tool. And what it does is it picks off all of that gunk. So I just lightly am brushing it. I've had a, oh, uh, I have a history of having a hard time getting masking fluid off of things, but these little masking fluid removers really do a dynamite job. And so what I'm doing here is I'm getting all the way back down to clean paper. And then uh, I can paint directly on top of this. Uh, let's see if where's that little watercolor kit. There it is. Hide it over here. Um, now when I paint on this, It's just like painting on G oh, I think what I'll do here is I'm gonna leave a little bit of white on the edges of some of these to be light hitting some of those surfaces. On a really small area like this, would it be possible to um, just paint the dark in around your object? Yes, it would. Um, and so that's another way to get these sort of light objects against a dark background. But when you have, uh, if you're doing things like with a really loose wet and wet wash, then um, it's going to be a lot more challenging to work a, a, a loose wash in around small objects. And so that's, that's one reason why people tend to like these um, like the, the masking fluid. And, uh, so Susan, send me a, your address, um, if you would, and I'll send you a little chunk of this. I'll just cut a little slice off of my, my little, uh, remover and, um, send that over to you and see if you see if you'll like it. Um, and I think that uh, otherwise I, I tend to kind of chew up my paper. All right. Are there any other? Um, let's let's check in with the mad botanist, um, Avea. What's happening in your journal? Thank you. Um, 
Oh, I'm excited to share. I just also saw that Mary um, asked a question. Um, do you not want to blow dry the watercolor because it would have affected the mask? Exactly. Exactly right. Good question. I've, I've done that in class. I think I've sometimes baked um, my mask onto my onto my paper. You're correct. Okay. That's a good question, Mary. Um, so first of all, just thank you for having us draw more birds. Um, it's getting easier over time. Ooh, oh, check your warblering out. So nice good. warbler diagram too. Thank you. That was one of the assignments, right? Yep, absolutely. Which was really, really fun. Handled like a boss here. Um, <laughs> yes. So yeah, thank you for these. It's, I'm, <laughs> I was scared of birds at first for a really long time, for years, and lately I've been feeling like I can get it, and that's <laughs> completely thanks to you, so thank you for that. Um, I've been trying to draw some of them um, a bit differently, too. Um, here, well, let me see here. I have an example. Um, wow. Thanks, wow. Kat. Um, so I start out, now I'm trying to draw the big ones, but then oh, I go... Yes. But then I go down and try to draw the small ones so that I can see what would be good for a field sketch. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out what the positions were that I saw them in. At one point I saw one with their back to me. And so I'm trying to find pictures so I can figure out how to draw that. And then another time when they were just kind of like staring directly at me, but that's difficult to find. And I'm figuring if I can come up with some really fast ways of drawing them, then that way when they keep moving around um, in the field, then it won't be so challenging to draw them. So I'm trying to keep note of what positions I see them in. Oh, wonderful. And, and also, yeah, so you'll find that photographers like the side view of birds' heads. And birds in real life are showing you all these different poses, but the photographers throw away all of their photographs that have all these other angles. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really hard to find, you know, those 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 front on views of of the of, of of a jay or other sorts of things. What I did with the warblers, and what I need to go back and do with these two, because these two are ones I see a lot at my sites, are to go on to iNaturalist, because people in there are, sometimes they're professional photographers, but a lot of times they're just amateurs like me, and so they'll catch all of the weird poses that the professionals never show you. Oh, and that's good. That's been kind of a fun thing to do. And then also, I wanted to thank you for um, today's workshop, especially, because it's going to help me a lot with some of my landscapes. Um, I've been trying, there's, there's a bunch of little mini sites that I go to um, within Battery East. And so I've been having wedge. trouble. Which one? Oh, yeah, the wedge. I, 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 like, I like the names for these. It, it kind of makes uh, priority one main stage. Oh, this is, did you uh, in, come up with the names yourself? Yourself? Most of them. Um, priority one is what it's always been called. Um, but I call the main stage the area with the um, with the pile of with the with the dump pile where we always put all of the things that we pull out um on the side of the hill just because it reminds me of the canticle for scarborough fair um the um what is this called mustard hill which is one of the biggest headaches ever and it's the reason why i'm going to get myself um a weed wrench among others this one though it's like dropping into a magic you go and i'm sure everybody has a place like this when you go into the forest or when you go beneath the shade of trees you drop in and suddenly you get all of these random plants everywhere and it feels like you're in a magic place and so i call it the vista gully because it reminds me of the movie from gully i don't know oh, um, and th these these uh, I, I love your your greens and these little moments of complex environments those are really challenging to do, but it can kind of get the sense of just the, the intimacy and how much you love these places. This is so cool. Thank you. And, and, and thank you for, I'm especially excited to eventually try the, the sponge technique that you taught us because oh, of do, do, you, do you have a little natural sponge nugget? Okay, um, I will, I'll mail you one, right? Thank I will you. kind of get uh, a, 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 a cleaner upper um, of the, what is it? Um, the the masking fluid off to to Susan, um, and I'll get a, um, a a little nugget of natural sponge off to you. Thank you. I really really appreciate that. Um, and I will send something to you in turn. I have something oh, for you. You you have sent something to me. I got this. So can, can I show what you made for the smalls? Sure, of course. <laughs> I, I, oh, actually, I don't don't I don't want it. Let, let, let's finish your share, and then um, I will. Um, and then I'll share that. Okay. This is just to say that I was not bluffing. I'm still drawing. Not it. bluffing. It's taking me a while to draw this because 
if you've ever gone to a place repeatedly and the place is really big and huge and dramatic, I, I think of Yosemite as being that example, but if you've gone to a place that has a bunch of really complicated geology and plants, and I'm trying to draw the entire view of it so that I can, and eventually I want to try to draw little bits and pieces of it. So, so like we have, we have random, um, what are these things called? Um, um, Monterey cypresses, thank you. <laughs> Monterey cypresses. Um, we have random Monterey cypresses. We have um, eucalyptus in the background. We have a huge diversity of random plants all over the slope, some of which is um, Cape ivy. Then we have these little bits of serpentine showing in here where things just fall down. And then we have a whole bunch of willows in here. And I'm looking at all of this and I'm like, oh God, where do I start? <laughs> so, um, so in pieces, <laughs> we're, so, yeah. we're separating them yeah. out. Um, I separate a chunk here, I draw this. Separate a chunk here, draw this. And I'm gonna do the same with the others. So, yay. Um, and so, sorry, I'll stop here, but yeah, just- well, and, and breaking big projects down into little projects is a great strategy. Um, a great thinking strategy, a great, a great getting things done strategy, a great tool for kind of, um, and then we wanna to try, to, try to reassemble those pieces in our brains. That's, that's wonderful. So thank you, um, thank you. I'll pass it to you. So um, you sent me a, a wonderful poem that you uh, converted to to calligraphy. Um, that I, I really appreciate. Can I may I read it? Yeah, of course. Um, and just makes me think about kind of um, going out and playing with, with thing one and thing two. The other thing that kind of came along in this, this care package um, is a button for um, Sabelle, um, who's an infectious disease specialist who's been frontline dealing with COVID. And for thing one and thing two, um, they had... Uh, at, at your inspiration, we went out as a family and we um, did um, uh, cleanup projects in a little uh, pocket park near our house. And um, we got um, nature and community steward buttons for each of them. And um, they're gonna love these. So the next time we kind of go out and have a little project, um, I'm gonna give them their Ivea buttons and they're gonna be, they're, they're, they're gonna dig on these. So maybe we'll um, we'll kind of wrap here today with a poem um, by um, Ivea Eaton, um, and the uh, is, is 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 this um, so uh, Ivea Eaton is that uh, oh, my birth name. When I was, um, I mean, Moore is my married name, but I was still Ivea Eaton when I wrote that poem. I was still a kid. Ah, excellent. So this is 11.34 a.m., 8 December 20, 2001. Um, how, how old were you when you wrote this? I think I was 15. This is cool. Um, so this makes me think about um, my, my uh, thing one and thing two. Um, Tell them stories, I say, and they will laugh. Tell them stories, I say, and they will cry. They will wonder. They will love. They will cherish. They will dream. They will falter. They will despair. Tell them stories, and they will wish it had been different for the lead person. Tell them stories, and they will want to cry out at every welling of emotion. Um, uh, uh, aging them. Tell them stories and they will have confidence. Tell them stories and they will understand. Tell them stories and they will learn. Tell them stories. Thank you so much. Um, a poem by Ivea Eden. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Um, so maybe before we close here, let's just bounce over to the good city of London and see what's happening in the journals of Ray Bonto. Um, and then um, 
that, that was a beautiful poem. I, I, I agree with Sherry. Thank you so much. Um, Ray Bonto, you may now unmute and here's Ray. Hmm. Ray Bonto, good to see you. Hi, good to see you. Well, I didn't get to do much since Tuesday because yesterday I had class and today I had stuff. Um, but, and I didn't have all the material, so I just went crazy. Um, <laughs> especially with the alcohol and salt. Um, that that yeah. alcohol does weird things, doesn't it? Yes. Um, I didn't have a dabbing tool. So what I did was take off the back of a pen and use it. <laughs> That'll and, work. But then it went a little too much. <laughs> but nothing really happened. Um, All right. Yep. The, um, uh, what I find um, is, is that sometimes i will um yeah I, I want to kind of keep messing with it and kind of um but i think it's one of those things like with the salt same thing where you you put it on and then you let it do its thing and then it uh and 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 then what it dries you get what you get yeah and um this was just alcohol and salt. Um, it's quite fun when you rub the salt off in the end. Mm hmm Oh, fun. Then, yeah, that's it. Oh, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Yeah, yeah you're just, um, you do a lot of just experimenting anyway with the, the colors and the paints and the way that they work. And that's such a good idea, a good way to kind of get to know the medium, get to know those colors. Um, so here's just a few more things to, 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 as you're, you know, practicing your washes, see at what point you can scrape them, see what kinds of paper you can scrape and um, have some fun with that. Thank you. I noticed um, Daniel Cordosi, um, I didn't realize that he'd, but I think he wants to share too. Oh, oh, great. Um, sir, um, welcome. Uh, wait, hold on a moment. We need to allow you to unmute. One moment. Um, and spotlight, for some reason, I, um, oh, there you go. I think you can talk now. Yeah, hi. Oh, hi. Good to see you. How are you? I'm doing very well. Did, did you ever get to see my barn owl? Your barn owl? Um, I don't think so. Oh, hold on. Let me remove my spotlight. Hold it up a little bit. Up a little bit more. And maybe hold it back from the screen just a little bit. A little bit more back from the screen. And up a little bit more. There we go. There we go. Oh, look at that. That you really have captured the that wonderful face of the bird. That folks notice that uh, eye on the far side. Um, it's seen at a foreshortened angle. It is so tempting to draw the faces of these birds with the eyes being the same shape because we know the eyes are roughly the same shape, but from different angles, um, especially on 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 owls you get these really, really interesting shapes on the far side. That's very well handled. And I also love that ochre color of the body. That's such uh -huh. a barn owl color. And <clears throat> I found this, okay? Can you see it? Yes. Right. I added an extension to it. Oh, oh, what fun. Yeah, when, 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 when people draw a real branch rather than a, just sort of a made-up branch, made-up branches never compare to real branches. Um, real branches do interesting organic things, and you really kind of get the sense that this woodpecker is on a, 
on, on, on a real piece of wood. That's great. I kind of like the clouds I put in there too. <laughs> yeah, nice soft edges. Oh. Ooh, uh, uh, move it a little bit to your right. Uh, to my right. Yeah, a little bit further to your right. Ah, oh, nice. Those that uh, the this the streaking on the breast really does help you get a sense for the roundness of the breast there. A northern water thrush. Mm -hmm. Ah. Okay. Well, <laughs> I tried, I tried something. It didn't turn out really the way I wanted it to. Oh, a salticid. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, so uh, this, this I'm really excited about. Um, so you've really kind of, the, the, the foreshortened angle um, on the head mm -hmm. is really working for me. These, 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 these spiders have such large forward facing eyes. Yes. I really like the way also the cephalothorax kind of tucks into the body there. Yeah. Um, oh, and, that's, that's fun. And excuse me, ladies, but they are darn cute. Believe me. They are darn cute. They <laughs> are so much fun. Um, when I was in uh, graduate school, uh, one of my friends was doing a study on salticids um, or, or, or jumping spiders. And they had, um, he had come up with, um, so was, uh, jumping spiders, when they see each other, will go through these elaborate displays and dances, wait, you know, wiggling their tushies and, and their, their, their legs are going up and down and their chelicery are doing little kind of these things. And then the other one will go into their little dance. And so what he did is he made an animated dancing jumping spider. Wow. And then um, he would put, he had a little clear sided box and he'd put that up against the computer screen and play, uh, hit play. And his little jumping spider would dance and the other little jumping spider would see it and the jumping spider would dance. Okay, that was fun. Um, but then what he did is he would start to remove features from the jumping spider in his animation. So what happens if you if there's no leg motion motion and just that you have this body form kind of going back? What would happen if you just have the pattern of the eyes? Wow. You know, so he was able to then figure out what was the stimulus that the jumping spider was uh, kind of responding to. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, it was just fascinating, fascinating stuff. How much of a representation of the jumping spider did the jumping spider need to, to kind of go into this dance? My recollection is that the eye pattern and the motion of it, so you could just kind of get these eyes kind of moving back and forth and the jumping spider would be like, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I, that was, it was a while ago. So that, that's more of a, a, a distant memory. I, I don't remember exactly what the, uh, the thing was, but those are, those jumping spiders are such beautiful, beautiful spiders. Uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed uh, uh, jumping spiders, uh, the males especially, uh, they have like what looks like little boxing gloves. Yes, yes. So the, the, those are their pedipalps. Yeah. Um, so maybe move it a little bit more this way. Yes, yes, there we go. The pedipalps um, on, on males are these little swollen things. Mm -hmm. And in their, their courtship displays, they, they will do this with their pedipalps. And then what they do is they make a little web and they deposit their sperm in that and suck it up with these, 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 with these pedipalps. And so they get those charged. And then when they go to mate, they take their, their little pedipalp and they put that in the epigynum of the female. And so it's this really kind of interesting sort of sperm transfer approach that is this dark pointed, uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, up here. Yeah. And, and each spider species has its own shape of pedipalp. It's sort of this lock and key thing. Um, so yeah. it's an incredible um, reproductive isolating mechanism as well. 
Oh, that's really cool. Uh, that would be the locking thing right there. And that's, and this is the side view of it. That's really neat. Um, when I went through the science illustration program at UC Santa Cruz, um, one of my co-workers, Giovanni Mackey, um, who was which is just an incredible, incredible illustrator, uh, coming out of that program, he got an assignment at the California Academy of Sciences drawing petty palps mm. of spiders. And he's been there ever since drawing petty palps of spiders. And the most beautiful, uh, mind-blowing um, the sketches of, of, of petty palps of spiders. Um, but he's been illustrating a bunch of books about spider petty palps. <laughs> um, uh, the, I got uh, to go outside and play though. Yeah, the person that uh, person that did these is uh, a person by the name of Wayne Madison. Yeah. Uh, now looks like you've got somebody uh, waiting up there. So I'll let you go. Um, hey, Daniel, thank you so much for sharing that. Really love um, those spider observations too. And also want to just encourage folks, when you've got a drawing of a bird, instead of putting it on a generic stick, find a real branch and look at it as its own unique thing. And that brings so much more intimacy to the sketches and drawings that you do. Yes, so that's exactly. people pay all this attention to the bird and then just kind of, you know, put it on an iron bar. But if you kind of look around, what are the, you know, what does this branch really look like? Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Good thing. Spotlight. And, um, and was there somebody else that wanted to share before we come to a close? And not seeing that, um, friends, thank you so much for being here. Um, I hope that this was a lot of fun for you folks and um, that you've got some new strategies and ideas of ways to play with watercolors. Um, don't rely on any of these techniques to kind of give you an effect. Um, the most important thing is to look at the phenomena, but then realizing that you can get some of these textures and things um, this way. Is, is a lot of fun. Um, thank you all for being here. And I look forward to seeing you all again. One last thought before we go um, is that um, coming up in June, um, I am going to be um, following my wife to Africa. She's going to be doing some work in a hospital in Kenya. And I'm going to be there with her helping take care of thing one and thing two. And at uh, this point, we don't know what kind of a, um, what kind of an internet reception uh, we're going to have there. Um, so um, during the time that I'm there, I'm initially going to be just sort of canceling the, the, the classes that I, um, I've been doing. Um, I may be able to do some remote ones from there, but if there is not a stable internet connection, I'm gonna to have to wait till I return, which would be in about two months. So starting June 9th, we're, um, we're, we're heading out. Um, Avea and uh, Billy Joe Reed are going to be um, taking uh, charge of the Nature Journal Educators Forum. And that will continue as a, a lively discussion forum. Um, and I still should be able to every once in a while kind of get on um, line and uh, might be able to record some things, might be able to then upload um, some stuff, but we're not going to be able to have um, I, I, or I, I don't know if we're going to be able to have our, um, our, our regular sessions. 
Um, also, <laughs> that would be the middle of the night over there. Um, if this whole flat, I mean, round earth theory is correct. So I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm suspecting that it'll be dark when it's light here. Um, but, but that would work better for Ray Bonto, right? Um, so um, I, there will be some changes in my, my schedule in the summer, um, but I want to, um, I want to encourage folks to, you know, keep your journaling on and also look for community and connection with a bunch of the other nature journal educators who are offering such amazing stuff in our community. There are some really generous, really thoughtful, beautiful, kind people that you can connect with. And something that I think really love about us is, is our community and let's not lose that. Um, and I will see all of you soon. Thank you, Avea, so much for helping uh, me manage these meetings. Also, the Educators Forum, thank you for taking that over. And um, we will see all of you again soon. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Jack. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>